ecosystems have a huge role in our future climate. And so that, that's what I'll be leading us uh, through. So, um, you know, we're all familiar with how climate change is driven by human activities, especially human extraction of fossil fuels from ancient reservoirs on land and at sea. We burn these fossil fuels for energy, and in the process, we emit greenhouse gases. Uh, the, the main greenhouse gases we emit are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And I'm just showing you here their uh, current contribution to uh, the contemporary greenhouse effect. Uh, I'll be focused today on carbon dioxide. I'll, I won't say much about methane or nitrous, but those are also of, of great interest. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at sort of the longer history of these greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. This graph shows concentrations of two of these gases, carbon dioxide in green and methane in orange. Uh, in two time periods, the pre-industrial starting in about 1750, and then the post-industrial starting at about 1900. And so what you see in the pre-industrial period, and really for much of Earth's history, is that natural processes, in other words, processes that humans really weren't affecting much, uh, were adding and subtracting greenhouse gases from the atmosphere in about the same amounts. In other words, there was a balance between additions and subtractions of greenhouse gases. But since 1900, uh, you know, this balance has been disrupted. These greenhouse gases are being added to the atmosphere faster than uh, we're removing them, and that is causing global warming. So I want to take just a few minutes and talk about how global warming works. So here we have the sun on the left, and then on the right, the Earth and its atmosphere. And you know, you'll notice, of course, that the Earth has some surfaces that are that are quite white, and other surfaces like oceans and and you know forests and deserts that are dark. So if we just magically rotate. So the Arctic ice cap is facing the sun. What we find is that shortwave radiation traveling through the atmosphere strikes a white surface and is reflected as shortwave radiation back to Earth. And so, um, you know, in, in this case, uh, sunlight comes in and it goes, it goes out and very little of it, very little of the energy is retained in the atmosphere. Now, by contrast, if that same shortwave radiation strikes a dark surface, then uh, it's absorbed and some of that energy is, is lost and it's re-radiated as long wave radiation, which um, is also known as heat. So, so uh, by this absorption is essentially uh, generating heat that's trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, you know, the more greenhouse gases that are on the atmosphere, the more of this long wave radiation is trapped. And sure enough, uh, that's the very simple theory of it and was understood back in the late 1800s, uh, by the way, where scientists as far back as then predicted that doubling the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere would cause a, a five degree increase in temperature. <laughs> And that is what's happening. So um, this is this is an animation starting back in the late 1800s. And what you see is that there's a certain amount of year-to-year -year variation in temperature on Earth. And then, you know, in the 50s, we start to see these warmer anomalies coming in yellow. And then by the time we hit the 80s, the pace of warming really accelerates. And at this point, it's just patently obvious to anybody who looks at this data that the Earth is warming. Um, and it's not warming evenly. It's warming quite, uh, the, the warming is quite faster at northern latitudes and, and some southern latitudes. Um, so 
we're now in a period of rapid climate change. It's a global problem and it's gonna require all of us to solve it. Um, so, you know, it's an existential threat to both people, but also I would say to ecosystems. Um, and, you know, slowly, too slowly, we're starting to adopt technology that will help slow the pace of climate change, things like wind power, solar, electric vehicles. This, this is stuff you all are familiar with. But this is where I kind of changed the direction of, I don't know, a lecture you've probably seen before and point out that despite all these things that we that we will we are doing and intend to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the living earth has a role in controlling climate and the response of the living earth is going to be very, very important as to what climate looks like in the future. So that's what I'll spend the rest of the talk on. Now we can understand the role of, of the living earth and I'll be focused on terrestrial ecosystems here. Uh, first by looking into the deep past. I'm gonna call this section science time machines. How do scientists look at past climates? Well, one way is to uh, take ice cores. This is one being taken from Antarctica and what you find once this ice core is polished is that air that was trapped in the loose snow deposited on the surface of Antarctica under pressure uh, changes into ice and the gas is trapped in the ice. And uh, we can age this ice and take layers off and look at the concentration of gases in these, in these bubbles. And when you do that, you can put together quite a long record. So here's an 800,000 year long record of climate, climate that had very little to do with people. I would say nothing to do with people. <laughs> and there's a few things to see here. So on the top graph, I have the CO2 concentration. On the bottom graph in red is the methane concentration in the atmosphere. And in the middle is temperature anomaly. And so just with a quick glance, you can see that there's a strong correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide, the amount of methane, and whether the, whether the earth is a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler at any given time. Um, the second thing to notice is that the, these temperature swings uh, are fairly constrained. You know, there's a 12 degree C difference, which is a large difference, but still, um, you know, fairly constrained over a very long period of time. And then um, finally is that there are these cycles. Clearly there's something that's causing, you know, up and down cycles that uh, are affecting climate. And so that's what I wanna talk about next. These cycles are driven by the amount of sunlight that strikes the earth. And that varies in uh, very predictable cycles that have to do with what the eccentricity of the earth, its obliquity or in precession, or I like to call it the wobble, the tilt, and the circularity. So these are very predictable and they interact with each other to create various cycles of various lengths. And that's what you were seeing in the former graph. But the amount of sunlight that strikes the earth in and of itself isn't enough to account for the amount of warming that takes place or cooling for that matter. The amount of sun energy hitting the earth can't explain how warm the earth gets <laughs> during one of these cycles. And the, the only way to explain it is by the existence of amplifiers, climate feedbacks. And here's how one of those would work. So let's say, uh, you know, the earth is in a cycle where it's getting more sunlight, it starts to warm and that puts vapor, water vapor in the atmosphere. That means more clouds. And if there's more clouds, that means that that sunlight is striking white surfaces and reflecting back out to space, which actually cools the earth. So this would be a negative feedback. There's also positive feedbacks in the earth physical climate system. More sunlight 
can warm the earth and that can cause ice to melt, which makes the earth darker, which uh, means that more of the sunlight is re-radiated re as long wave radiation, the earth gets warmer, more ice melts and so forth. That's a positive feedback. So in the absence of, uh, you know, just from based on physical processes, we have both negative and positive feedbacks. And it's the interaction of these or the balance of them that gives us the, uh, the global temperature. Negative feedbacks in the form of more clouds, positive feedbacks in the form of less ice. So those are physical processes, but there are also equivalent biological processes that cause feedbacks. And here are the two that I'll be talking about. One is the ability of plants to take up carbon dioxide, and the other is the ability of microbes to release carbon dioxide. And these are feedbacks that operate through the Earth's great ecosystems. And let's just do a quick tour of those. I will, we'll start in the, at northern latitudes with tundra uh, and you know permafrost, boil forests. Headed south, we find temperate forests. Sometimes they're fairly dry, but if they're quite wet, then we call these swamps. In the tropics, we have rainforests, some of which are are wet, but not as wet as those on the floodplain of the Amazon River. And then sometimes they're both wet and salty, and that's what we call mangrove swamps. And we also have grasslands like savannas, uh, which are often quite dry, but when they're wet, we call them tidal marshes. And when they're very, very wet, we call them seagrass meadows. And all of these ecosystems covering a third of the Earth's surface have in common these features. They have plants that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and microorganisms that return it. Sometimes, you know, always as carbon dioxide, but sometimes also as methane. So what I want to do next is take this gen, you know, this generalizations I've been talking about and put a few numbers on them so that you can appreciate just how important these ecosystems are in Earth's climate. And so now we're going to put some numbers up here. These are all petagrams, 10 to the 15 grams. Um, if you're not familiar with that unit, it's a lot. And what I want to do is have you focus on this atmospheric pool of 750 petagrams. That's the CO2 in the atmosphere that keeps the Earth from being a frozen ball of ice and now is causing it to warm up uh, more than we might like. And I want you to compare that 750 for ha to how much carbon is locked in land plants, which is nearly the same amount, 560 petagrams. And then you look at soils and there's actually twice as much carbon in soils as there is in the atmosphere. There's also a lot of carbon in the oceans and I won't be talking about that today but oceans are, are, are a big part of this story. So this is just how much is locked up in these different pools, the atmosphere, plants, and soils. But then there's also the annual exchanges, how much um, gets taken out or added each year. So plants remove 120 of these units. So they remove you know, a, a good deal, 15% every year of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. Uh, in photosynthesis. And then they return about half of that in their own respiration. Microbes return the other half. And, and by the way, this is all in the pre-industrial, we're still in the past, the pre-industrial period before humans have really started to perturb this. So the system was more or less in balance, 120 in, 120 out, the atmospheric pools staying more or less the same. So um, people have obviously changed this balance. And my point is that people in this case, we're the wobble. We, the people, are the wobble. The wobble that first starts the climate to change, and then all these feedbacks are amplifying that. So how will these biological feedbacks 
react to the to our our wobble, which is more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And here, of course, we're talking about the future, although I would say that increasingly we're talking about the present too. And I'm going to consider two feedbacks, the ones I've already mentioned to you, the first one being photosynthesis. Uh, this is a close-up of a leaf surface, and this hole in the middle is a stomate through which plants take up carbon dioxide. They use that to produce sugars, and they use those sugars for their metabolic activity and to grow. Uh, CO2, you can see, is a key component of photosynthesis, which is why it acts like a fertilizer. And in fact, you can actually buy CO2 fertilizer. This is CO2 fertilizer for aquarium plants. And in fact, when there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the, the idea and the truth of it is that it actually acts like a fertilizer to increase plant growth, sort of like nitrogen or phosphorus. And so this is our example of a negative biological feedback where people are putting more CO2 in the atmosphere, increasing CO2 concentration that stimulates photosynthesis and plant growth, and that stimulation of plant growth feeds back negatively on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, the way we, uh, meaning, meaning scientists like myself who study this kind of problem, have been uh, trying to figure that out how large this feedback might be, is to do experiments in the field. And what you're seeing here is one of the first experiments to raise carbon dioxide around plants in a real life ecosystem, not in the greenhouse, but out in the field. This started in 1987. And uh, the question that was being asked at that time is whether terrestrial plants will grow faster in an atmosphere of elevated CO2. And three decades later, really nearly four decades later, Later, this experiment is still running. It's now the longest running climate change experiment in the world. Um, it's an experiment that, that I run. I inherited it at year 10. And what we've learned from this is that, yes, indeed, <clears throat> indeed, most plants will grow faster in a high CO2 world. Uh, there are caveats to that. There are things that can limit how much that increase in growth will be. But this is how we do those sorts of experiments. Uh, each of these chambers is essentially uh, a wall that's open on the top and on the bottom, blocking the wind. And then we introduce an artificial wind through these pipes. And to some of these, we add pure carbon dioxide to simulate the year 2100. And these types of experiments are being done not just in this tidal wetland in Maryland, where I'm sitting right now, but also uh, in forests in North Carolina, this is a loblolly pine forest, sweet gum forest in Tennessee, a eucalyptus forest in Australia, this grassland in Sweden, this desert in Nevada, uh, agricultural soybean uh, field in Illinois, and this finally this cottonwood forest, which is a different type of crop, a tree crop in Michigan. And by doing these types of experiments in many different ecosystems uh, over the years, we've learned that, that, the, that these ecosystems will, in fact, help mitigate climate change, at least um, with respect to wood growth. And so what I'm showing you now is some data that we summarized a few years ago from four of these experiments. And on the y-axis here is wood biomass. I'm plotting wood biomass because if the plant takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and puts it into wood, then it stays out of the atmosphere for a fairly long period of time. And so it can be considered to be sequestered. And in each case, I'm showing you how much wood, how much wood would be in a, a square meter of, of one of these forests under the present day CO2 concentrations in blue and how much there'll be in future forests in green. And you can see in each case, there's, there's more wood 
being produced and stored. And this is going to help. Uh, this is going to help feedback on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in a negative way. It's going to help reduce the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere, a negative feedback. So the wood sink is important. Now I'm going to go and talk about the example of a positive biological feedback. And in this case, the air gets warmer, the soils get warmer, microbes are more active in warm conditions, and so they decompose soil organic matter faster, adding CO2 and methane to the atmosphere, which causes the air to warm. You can see how much carbon is in the soil, just referring back to this big number. So rather than me explain the process of decomposition, uh, I'm going to show a little video. I had the great fortune several years ago now, 2008, to be the curator of a major exhibit here at the Smithsonian called Dig It, The Secrets of Soil. And one way we communicated this you know, kind of difficult topic to our general audience uh, was to put together a video um, based on based on called Soil Science Investigations in which there was a, a pumpkin murder and uh, the detectives are trying to figure out who done it. So um, hopefully this will come across okay. And uh, I'll play a short, just a section of this video where we describe the process of decomposition. What do you notice? I don't see a lot of dead plants like the marsh soil. Right. In upland forest soils, there's more oxygen and a whole world of critters that feed on dead plants and animals. Fallen leaves are colonized by microbes that feed on leaf tissue. The microbes become food for earthworms and other insects. Eventually, the tons of leaves and twigs that fall each year are reduced to a few tiny bits. Sounds like a feeding frenzy. Microbes eat dead plants. Animals eat microbes. Animals eat each other. I had no idea there was so much death and destruction in soil. Not just death, there's also lots of life. In a single square meter of garden soil, there are trillions of bacteria and fungi, billions of protozoa and nematodes, plus thousands of mites, springtails, insects, slugs, and snails. Not to mention a mammal or two. All in this tiny square? Yep and it recycles nearly all the nutrients this forest needs to grow. Soils are the ultimate recycling bin, a circle of life. The ultimate recycling bin, and if you've, you've probably seen images like this, uh, a compost pile with vapor coming off of it, that's water vapor, and it's because the compost pile in the center is superheated with all the metabolic activity of microbes, which not only release heat, but also carbon dioxide in the process. Um, and so here again, scientists are performing experiments where we're warming soils, simulating the future. Here's a very clear example of a, a forest in Massachusetts, and you can easily tell that the the plots that are being heated <laughs> against the ones that aren't. But uh, there's also similar experiments in uh, Arctic tundra. This is Alaska. This is a tidal wetland in Germany. And this is a sister experiment to that one here in Maryland. And again, it's another one of the experiments that I operate here at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And uh, the, the way this experiment is set up is that we have chicken heaters that heat the plants from above, and then we have cables, the same cables that you would use to keep your driveways free of snow and really cold places uh, like Denver, perhaps, um, that in this case go to about five feet deep. And so it's a whole ecosystem warming experiment, and it has four levels. Uh, current ambient levels in blue, 1.7 degrees centigrade above ambient, 3.4 and 5.1. And what I'm showing in this data on the left side is 
the amount of carbon dioxide that's being emitted from this ecosystem on the left, and on the right, the amount of methane being emitted. It is a wetland, it emits methane. And in the center is just a picture of how we measure the emissions of these gases. But what you see is that it's, as these soils warm, they will emit more carbon dioxide and, meth and methane. And so just like with these physical feedbacks, the question becomes, what is the future balance? You know, which one it, will one of these dominate the other? Will, will, will the increase in CO2 uptake be larger than the CO2 release from microbes? Now, this is a complex question, very difficult to answer. And the way, and the way we answer a question like this is through Earth system models. Uh, so on the right, you're seeing a, a uh, depiction of the globe split into cells. Uh, each, each part of the land surface is a cell. And then there's a cell of atmosphere above it, several cells actually. And each, each land cell has layers in it that represent different layers in the soil. And for each of these cells, we have um, you know, mathematical layers that simulate climate, that tell us what the land cover is, whether it's in forest, grassland, agriculture, what have you, uh, certain properties of the soil, properties of the vegetation, topography, that sort of thing. And collectively, these, these models allow us to understand how increasing carbon dioxide, temperature, changes in rainfall, and so forth will affect these exchanges of greenhouse gases with land and with ocean. Um, you know, the early versions of these models were very crude. In fact, I think they only had ocean, <laughs> the earliest ones. But then they added land, and it was just land and ocean. But over time, they've become much more sophisticated. And I am currently a chief scientist as, uh, of a project called Compass. It stands for Coastal Observations, Mechanisms, and Predictions Across Systems and Scales. The important words here are coastal and, uh, well, really, that's really the only important word. <laughs> um, what we're doing in this, in this project funded by the Department of Energy is, is trying to improve Earth system models to account for coastal ecosystem processes. So currently, these models represent the coast like this upper image. Basically, you have land in green, ocean in blue, and then you have a, a pipe, a river pipe that connects the two. So that's the current state of affairs. And our vision is to uh, perform, uh, perform a variety of studies and, and experiments so that it looks more like this bottom image where the coast has rivers, wetlands, estuaries, near shore oceans, and so forth. And where, the, and where there's exchanges of carbon and nutrients that are more realistic. Again, this is all to get at uh, really understanding the, the role of ecosystems in our future climate. So let's uh, bring us back. We, we started at the past and then we jumped to the future. And now I'm gonna bring us back to the present. So here's that graph that I showed earlier, the ice core record of carbon dioxide in blue and methane in red. And I've plotted on here uh, the approximate concentration current concentration of carbon dioxide, which is 421 parts per million. You can see that it falls well outside even the highest concentrations in the past really million years. We have a longer record now. And uh, we know that temperatures are have already increased by half a degree C. And so, um, you know, we, we are already seeing temperature anomalies. But how do we, you know, so, so, so that, that, that's what's happening with respect to current climate and greenhouse gases. So, and how is this related to, the next question I'm gonna ask is how it's related to um, imbalances 
in the global carbon budget. So here we are back again with this global carbon budget figure. And this time I'm just, I'm just reporting the imbalances themselves. And uh, the brown arrows represent imbalances that are new fluxes, new fluxes due to humans. So we, the humans, are adding about 10 petagrams per year to the atmosphere. 90% of that comes from fossil fuels and the other 10% from land use change, cutting forests, for example. And, and, and so really this question of feedbacks from ecosystems comes down to, well, if there were no ecosystem feedbacks, then the atmospheric pool would grow by 10 petagrams each year. But that's not what's happening. The atmospheric pool is growing by five, which means that 50% of what we put in the atmosphere is ending up in ecosystems. Half of that is going into oceans, that's the ocean acidification problem, and the other half is going into terrestrial ecosystems, primarily plants. And so um, ecosystems are both a source in terms of the forest we're cutting and a sink in terms of this higher growth of plants. And so, um, so, so both physical feedbacks and ecosystem feedbacks are at work here. Now, now this is natural. These are feedbacks that have always worked this way. And so how do we know that the climate change we're seeing isn't just the result of these physical and biological feedbacks? Well, if we use our Earth system models to say, try to hindcast going back to the pre-industrial 1860 to the present, and we use only natural processes, the red line is what those models uh, predict on average. All these yellow squiggly lines, that means that about a dozen different Earth system models were used in this analysis, and the average is in the red. But what we actually see is in this black line. So it's clear that what we're seeing can't be explained by natural causes. Now, if we add both natural and human sources of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, and natural and human feedbacks, the two match up. So it's clear that the only way we can explain current climate is by the combination of human activity and earth system feedbacks. The problem involves both people and ecosystems, which raises the possibility that we might actually be able to manage ecosystems to benefit climate. And this is what we call natural climate solutions. Uh, excuse me, um, Patrick, I'm going to just interrupt briefly. We do have a question in the audience, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe uh, uh, tied in uh, roughly in this part of your presentation. One of our members asks, um, what are the sizes of these biological feedbacks compared to non-biological feedbacks like ice albedo, uh, ice albedo feedback? water vapor feedback and so on? You know, that's a good question. And I, I honestly don't think I have a good answer to it. <laughs> um, yeah, and if, I, and if I guess, I'm probably, I'm, 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 going, uh, I'm going out on a limb, but my gut feeling is that they're they're comparable to one another. And so that'll be my answer, which I'll put an asterisk by. Uh, and then after the seminar, I'll, I'll try to answer that for myself <laughs> and send you the answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so... Um, I think I think a little bit of that, and you know that because these things are tied together, um, we we know that, for example, we know that changes that that some of these biological feedbacks actually do operate through albedo. For example, 
places where there's now more forest, um, well, for example, in, in uh, Arctic and boreal systems, uh, which historically, let's just take Arctic systems, which you know really don't have forests and uh, are often white with ice or snow and have high albedo, you know, once that ice melts and then forests come in, the forests themselves are the cause of, of low albedo. So, so these things interact. And uh, this whole issue of natural climate solutions is, is really kind of related to that. So basically, um, you've all heard of the Paris Agreement, this, this agreement to try to limit global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade, one part of which, uh, well, an important aspect of which is something called nat nationally determined contributions. That is pledges that countries make to try to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions or increase their greenhouse gas sinks. And they can do this in part through improved ecosystem management. The types of uh, things that that uh, countries are doing is making commitments to plant forests. And this is a particularly creative way to spread uh, tree seeds through a forest. These types of commitments um, are considerable. Um, you know, there's also the question of how well these commitments come through, but the, the promises are, are considerable and, and uh, have the potential to significantly reduce greenhouse gas concentrations. We can farm differently through things like no-till agriculture. We can restore ecosystems like this tidal marsh. These are called blue carbon ecosystems. And um, when you add all this together, this is a paper that I was involved in a few years ago based just on emissions from the US. Um, and I, I, I think we, you know, did a pretty good job of, of being realistic about, for example, you know, one of the rules for this analysis was you can't convert agricultural lands to forests. We still need agriculture. So, you know, using rules like that, we, we still came up with the numbers that suggest that we could offset a fifth of U.S. carbon dioxide emissions just through better management of, of forests well, of, of ecosystems, forests, grasslands, and wetlands. And so um, what this comes down to is that we really need people and ecosystems working together. We need to increase the amount of CO2 uptake, which would be a negative feedback, which is why this goes down. And we also need to reduce the release of greenhouse gases from people and ecosystems, which would be a positive feedback. We need to reduce both. And if we can do that, we get other co-benefits by, by good ecosystem management. We get clean water, clean air, healthy soil, uh, improved biodiversity. Uh, so, so this this area of ecosystem response to climate change is a major focus of the Smithsonian. And today I've been describing this piece on the left, ecosystem feedbacks on climate, which you know, operate through greenhouse gases. We also do a lot of work trying to understand the response of ecosystems, both terrestrial and aquatic. Uh, we do a lot of work on, for example, coral reefs and seagrasses to climate change. And we also work on solutions, things like carbon trading to help incentivize ecosystem respiration. And these are the sort of things that uh, here at the Smithsonian give us earth optimism. Um, essentially the hope that we will eventually get ahead of this and stabilize climate. And that is what I have to present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I enjoyed that very much. Um, I'll start uh, off with a question. Oh, go ahead, please. Go ahead. This is Jan Rose from the Colorado Coalition for a Livable Climate. And 
my question, uh, the reason I raised my hand was during the forest part of the presentation, uh, because um, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado officially uh, transformed from a carbon sink to a carbon emitter in 2021 through a combination of beetle kill and wildfire. And so we are in the midst of revising our greenhouse gas reduction roadmap for our state with a goal of 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. My question is, um, is anybody running experiments um, as a result of wildfire and or beetle kill of how long afforestation will take to achieve the level of carbon dioxide removal that happened when the forest was healthy. Uh, well, thanks for that. First of all, thanks for that uh, antidote. Um, it's, 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 it's a story that I think everybody here can appreciate is being repeated everywhere. Um, these huge forest fires in Canada are something that we're all experiencing right now. And 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 I can tell you that our community certainly is studying that very question very intensely. And the general story is that um, you can wipe out centuries of carbon sequestration by a forest with just a single fire. Um, and you can also mobilize vast amounts of carbon from ecosystems that form peat, like, like these tropical peat forests, when they dry out often because of draining and burn. And so uh, this, is, this is an example of, of feedbacks where a warming, you know, I, I focused on a couple of feedbacks involving carbon dioxide and photosynthesis and decomposition, but this is another example of a positive feedback where forests dry and then are more likely to burn, adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, leading to more drying and more burning. So, um, so yeah, that is something that we're well aware of. I'd say fire is, well, of course the beetles also subject the forest to fire. Um, and, and these global earth system models that I talked about uh, these fire feedbacks are a big interest uh, for developing those models in the first place. But to your knowledge, there are no active experiments in places of, let's say, fires from 2010, for example, um, to determine, you know, it takes a long time for a tree to absorb the same amount of carbon dioxide it absorbed as an adult tree. So, so you know, if we have to reforest a, a ton of lost acreage here in the Rocky Mountains in the West and Canada, I mean, is it going to take us a century to just to get us back to square zero? Uh, my guess is the answer is yes. Thank you. Okay, we have I, a question. I just add one thing quickly to that, which is that is that um, it, it's both the loss of the, of the trees and their sequestration potential, but um, often those fires can burn off soil organic matter too. So just throw that in there. Okay, we have a question from the audience. How much of an effect, and it sounds like you have partially addressed this at least, how much of an effect are wildfires? Wildfires. Yeah. What, um, yeah, wildfires are a huge source of concern for the reasons I just explained. Um, and, you know, it's something that we've been predicting now for about 30 years. And, and in the last several years, you're re really seeing it, these feedbacks play out in real time. Um, it's going to make it very difficult to use forests as a way of mitigating climate change. Okay. Uh, Doug, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, this is a 
quite a question, but a, a more request. And I, I wonder if uh, you have a list of publications uh, uh, regarding these studies. Oh yeah, I'd be happy to pull together some publications on this. I'd, I'd be interested. Yeah, and let me know. Um, I can share my email address. I'll I'll put in the chat. Um, let me know if uh, you have any particular interests, since you know I covered a lot of ground there. Yeah, in particular, I'm, I'm I am interested in in the relative size of of these biological feedbacks versus the uh, non biological ones. I've the reason I ask, it, in, in fact, is because if you look at, you know, standard climate change texts, they do not mention biological uh, feedbacks. So I, I'm very curious exactly what what the size is with respect to these others. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you can imagine. I mean, so so that question, at least when it was asked the first time, I took it very literally as if they're two completely separate things. Uh, but you know, they are connected to one another um, through changes in albedo and greenhouse gases. And I think I, I think that um, that budget I put up, where you know we're emitting ten petagrams a year to the atmosphere. And terrestrial systems alone are removing 2.5 gives you a sense of just how important it is. That's 25% of what we emit every year is going back into ecosystems. And, and then the other 25% is going into oceans. Some of that's also biological. Some of it is just dissolution of CO2 and water, but quite a bit of it is biological through phytoplankton productivity that sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so, so yeah, I think if, if the question is just how quantitatively important is it, those numbers alone tell you that it's quite important. Yeah, in fact, that one uh, graph you showed, in fact, just before the question was asked, I kind of thought maybe that answered it, but not okay. Yeah, it's a good question, and I'm glad you brought it up because that that is that is why I put those numbers up there. Um, they're they're big. <laughs> okay, uh, David Millis, you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, Pat, thank you so much for tonight. It's uh, really been very interesting. Um, uh, I, I thought I'd throw the hand grenade question out. I, I have heard a few global scale um, biological, you know, um, shift things like seeding oceans or things of this sort, right? Um, Typically, they're almost always the start of a science fiction novel, which goes terribly wrong. Um, but I'm, I'm hearing some proposals like this. Do you have any comments on any specific biological type, global scale things that are being tossed around? Well, um, yeah, I, I hear about, there, there's a lot of, uh, stuff that kind of falls into the category you describe that you know is the start of a horror movie type thing they seem <laughs> um they seem almost ridiculous everything from trying to seed all the world's bogs with uh high lignin sphagnum um to harvesting forests and 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 burying the logs in the ocean which and then, you know, I mean, like I say, they vary in terms of just how practical they might be. Uh, I think on the biological side, one of the more interesting and potentially uh, practical ones, although it still scares me, is seeding the um, Pacific Ocean with iron. So if you're not familiar with that story, there's an, a large region of the Pacific where phytoplankton productivity is actually limited by iron. And the only iron in the whole system gets blown from the Sahara Desert quite a distance away. And the idea is that if we added iron, uh, there'd be more phytoplankton growth. And that would, just like the CO2 I was talking about, the plant um, 
feedback would sink into the ocean. So th that has actually been the subject of large scale experiments. Doesn't, do doesn't seem to be real practical. As far as I'm concerned, the only geoengineering, which is the top, the, 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 the term this falls under that I think makes any sense to me at least, is the idea of adding aerosols to the atmosphere. So it's not biological. And the reason, the reason I am a little more comfortable with that is that aerosols have a very short lifetime in the atmosphere. And so if we find that there's that we've screwed it up, it's reversible. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my answer. Yeah. Buy your sulfur stocks now. Yeah. <laughs> and again, thank you so much for tonight. This has been wonderful. I actually have a question, although um, if it's not a comfortable question, I would respect, um, you know, if, if you didn't want to answer, uh, address this. Uh, I've, you know, at the times I visited DC, I of course love visiting the Smithsonian um, Museum, uh, particularly the Natural History Museum. And each time I've been very impressed and very pleased with the uh, commitment and dedication to messaging about climate change. I, it almost seemed like every chance the, I guess I'll say they're curators who design those exhibits, it seems like every chance, even if they're not directly talking about climate change, they're talking about something else and they talk about it in the context of climate change. So that's just constantly talking about <clears throat> how climate change works or how this or that is going to be affected by climate change. For example, in the even in the human evolution uh, section, they, <laughs> they talk about the world in which we evolved and how it's changed since people emerged. And, and uh, I, I just, and, and I guess the, 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 the reason I point this out is this isn't this, I believe the Smithsonian is federally funded and there's certain um, areas, certain factions within BC that, uh, uh, you know, uh, and it's hard to say how much are anti-climate change, yet you guys are still, is this a brave move or are you guys just ignored? Well, um, you know, I don't know, that, that's, a, that's a good question, Greg. Um, Yeah, the, you know, and you brought up the human evolution exhibit, which, which does, which, you know, did wrap in climate change, you know, natural climate change with human evolution and so forth. Um, and that is one that uh, we've gotten some criticism for, for not being aggressive enough on climate change. Be but I think a lot of that um, it's because that hall was funded by the Koch brothers. And um, I think, you know, the source of funding just evoked skepticism about, mm -hmm. about, you know, what, how the curators at the Smithsonian handled the topic. But, but I'm pleased that you noticed that we actually, um, you know, do deal directly with climate, climate change in that exhibit. And I think the reason it's, it's theirs because you know we're we're scientists and you know we we understand uh, the situation and and that's what we do. Um, you know we are meant to be a trusted source of information. The reason that we don't take more heat for it um, might well I mean I like to think that we try to be very objective and balanced and and so hopefully that. Um, helps blunt criticism. Um, I do think we fly under the radar <laughs> in the sense that uh, we're a very small budget and a very big organization. And also I'll point out that we are a nonprofit organization. We're not a federal agency. Uh. Um, and so as a nonprofit organization, you know, that insulates us a bit, even though we do get a lot of federal funding. We're a nonprofit established by the U.S. government. 
that's the relationship. Um, uh, and also, interestingly, I think that just the way we're chartered um, engages a lot of the political community in DC. So our, our board of regents includes the Speaker of the House, the Chief Justice, and you know whoever's in those seats at that time uh, sit on our board. And so I think that gives politicians of all stripes um, you know, some some ownership of the Smithsonian. I am glad you reminded me that the Koch brothers, I understand, gets a lot, lots of their money from fossil fuels. So it's interesting how that just happens anyway. That's it's nice. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, you know, when we accept gifts like that, it's with the understanding that the curators are in charge of the content. Thanks, Pat. This is Jan Rose again. I I hesitate to monopolize the conversation, but I mentioned in a, in in my previous question that the uh, state of Colorado is in the midst of refining its greenhouse gas reduction goals to make them more aggressive. So my question to you is, if you could suggest something, one thing that the state of Colorado could do. Um, to most rapidly and obviously reduce greenhouse gases in our state, um, would you be willing to make a recommendation? Well, this will sound like a sidestep, Chan. <laughs> but um, one thing that is absolutely clear is that it's going to take a hundred of those things. Uh, the, the, the problem is so massive that, you know, we, th there really is no silver bullet. Um, that said, um, you know, clearly, you know, transportation is a huge source of greenhouse gases. So, I think anything we can do to accelerate the, um, you know, the adoption of electric vehicles and, you know, not just cars, but, you know, there were, there's a lot of research going into boats and even planes now. Um, and, you know, building out the electrical, you know, the, the, the charging grid for those vehicles is, I think, the most likely way to have a big impact in a short period of time. So that's obvious to everybody. I don't even think I had to say that. Um, methane is a big issue. I think anything that can be done to reduce methane emissions is helpful. And so that would include um, shoring up the methane distribution grid because it's leaky as all get out. Uh, and uh, also just, Lowering demand for natural gas will be helpful. Um, and then, you know, uh, anything, th then, you know, there's all the other things. Diet is a big one. Uh, you know, the less meat we consume, the less cows there are, the less methane is emitted. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, consequences that spill out from that. Uh, so I, I guess it's probably all things you've heard about before, and I don't really have anything magical to offer. Uh, I mean, if it makes you feel better, Colorado has already really, really aggressive goals in all those areas. Uh, so we acknowledge and agree with those. But an example in the natural lands area that uh, I think is worthy of pursuit is that we grow a lot of flood irrigated alfalfa in this state and we are a drought stricken state. Mm. So what would the impact be if we switched from alfalfa to switchgrass, the original diet of the buffalo, the bison, 
uh, and uh, encouraged our farmers to move away from flood irrigation of alfalfa and into multi-crop, you know, multi harvest per year. I think switchgrass produces about three harvests per year. Um, you know, would that make a significant impact on, um, on, on soil sequestration and uh, emissions reduction in your view? Okay, yeah, and I apologize. I was, I was interpreting your question much more broadly, but it makes sense to be thinking about natural lands. Uh, yes, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't know much about Colorado, uh, but I can tell you that um, what you're suggesting about switching from, from sounds like alfalfa that's grown with irrigation, um, how wet are those soils when they irrigate? Well, what they do is use snow runoff to flood the fields and they grow the seed from those floodwaters, much like uh, Southeast Asia does with rice paddies. Well then, yeah, th that would actually, <laughs> I think that would actually be a big one because, um, and I'm sure you all are aware of this, but you would benefit in a couple of ways, uh, but, but the big one of course is methane emissions. Uh, that when you flood those fields, they're emitting methane. And the greenhouse gas, met methane is a particularly powerful greenhouse gas. It's between 30 and 45 times uh, more powerful than carbon dioxide on a, 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 a one for one basis. And so the math of reducing methane emissions from that those agricultural fields would be really impressive um, as long as you don't start adding a lot of extra fertilizer nitrogen fertilizer to them if you do that now you're going to get nitrous oxide emissions so so that would be that that would be the part of this I'd want to understand is is what the consequences are for nitrous oxide emissions makes a lot of sense to me I'm not seeing any questions come in on the chat. Um, does anybody have something they want to ask? Uh, we're at uh, about 8.14 at the moment. Um, we don't have to remain here till 8.30 if everyone's out of their questions. It's, I'll remind everyone, it's a, uh, Patrick is in a different time zone from us. So I don't need to keep him up unnecessarily. Any final questions? I've tried to answer a couple of questions in the chat. Um, ah. Somebody, uh, Kurt, asked if carbon capture is a legitimate alternative, um, accepting oil and gas considered a money making alternative. Um, yeah, that's another sort of geoengineering question. And, um, you know, I, I think that's definitely an alternative that we have to understand and invest some research effort in. I don't see it as sufficient. And, you know, I just, what I understand about carbon capture, carbon capture, for example, you might take the CO2 effluent from a power plant and pump it deep into the earth uh, to sequester it. Um, or deep into the ocean. I think both of those can present can present problems, for example, to aquifers. Uh, but there's enough potential there to, to do the research. I just um, personally don't like it. <laughs> personally, I think we just have to reduce our emissions um, and take care of our ecosystems. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this. And again, I just want to thank you all for, for inviting me. So, yeah. I really I, I, it as I, well. I wish your organization a lot of success. Thank you. I appreciate that. And this is a wonderful presentation and uh, appreciate your time and your expertise. Okay. 
All right. Well, I think I'll go home. Yes. Uh, you all have a good night. Thank you.